dive right into both these issues with House Intelligence Committee Chairman and January 6th Committee member, Democratic Congressman Adam Schiff. Congressman, thank you for being with us. Let's start with worries of potential war breaking out with Russia. The full House will get a classified briefing on Ukraine on Thursday. What's the top question you want answered? Well, I've had a, a several briefings already this week, uh, and obviously we're watching this very closely to figure out what uh, Putin's next move is. And if there's anything that we can do to raise the deterrence against a Russia invasion. Uh, and I think the Biden administration has done everything conceivable, uh, rallied our allies around a really tough set of sanctions, uh, tougher than we've ever uh, exacted uh, on a country like Russia. Uh, we have worked with the British, I think, to front some of what we know about their efforts to create a pretext for invasion, about their efforts to create a puppet government uh, in Ukraine. Uh, we have made it clear to Putin we're going to move NATO assets closer to Russia, not further away if they go through with this. So it will defeat his objective. Uh, and I think in every way that we can, the administration and, and now the Congress is working to try to deter Putin. Uh, now, he still may not be deterred, but we're doing everything possible. So right now, do you think Russia will invade? And has anything changed your assessment one way or the other in recent days? Uh, you know, I've been skeptical uh, from the very beginning about whether uh, anything we could do would stop Putin from invading, uh, if that's his intention. And uh, I think it's very possible that is exactly what he intends to do, uh, and nothing will stop him. But we can raise the costs if it comes to that. Uh, and we're obviously working on that, too, to provide uh, weapons to Ukraine, defensive weapons, uh, where they can make it long and painful if Russia tries to occupy uh, further portions of Ukraine. Uh, and so we're doing what we can. I, I've been skeptical of uh, Putin's intentions all along. Uh, I think he feels that his last invasion of Ukraine did not have its intended effect. It really drove Ukraine more into the West. Uh, and he may feel now he's just got to militarily take over the whole country uh, to prevent it uh, from uh, growing closer to the United States and the West. In terms of potential leverage Putin could have, we know Russia supplies a lot of energy to parts of Europe. And the Polish prime minister brought up the controversial Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline project today, saying that it's a threat to peace in Europe. And he called it a, quote, gun in the hands of Mr. Putin with which he can blackmail the European Union. Do you agree? Uh, I do agree. That's always been a concern I've had about that pipeline, which is the more you allow Europe to become dependent on Russia, uh, the more you make that easy, the more, for example, uh, he can cut off Ukraine, uh, through which that fuel would otherwise flow, um, then uh, you're strengthening his position uh, geopolitically uh, and strategically. Um, so what should be done about allies, that? Well, look, I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, there's strong sentiment in Europe, including uh, I, would, uh, I, I would expect in Germany that if Russia invades, that's the end of that pipeline. Uh, it's gone for good. Um, and that's the way it should be. Uh, so I think that is one of the more powerful deterrents that we in Europe have. Uh, but it's got to be crystal clear to the Russians that if they do invade, uh, they can kiss that goodbye for, and not just temporarily, but for good. Bottom line, help our viewers understand why this matters so much here at home. If Russia takes over Ukraine, what does that mean for the U.S.? Well, what that means for the U.S. is that nations can remake their borders, uh, like during World War II, by dint of military force. Uh, and today it may be Ukraine, and maybe tomorrow Russia decides to invade uh, a NATO ally. And then we have an Article Three requirement to go to their defense uh, but also other nations are watching. Uh, China is watching with an eye towards the possible invasion of Taiwan. So this is inherently destabilizing uh, and could lead to a broader conflict. Uh, but it also undermines democracy. And and we as, as a champion of democracy around the world, and we've got obviously our own problems here at home, mm -hmm. but we have an obligation uh, to live up to that legacy and come to the aid and support of our democratic allies like Ukraine. So let's talk about the threat to democracy here at home, uh, specifically your investigation being part of the January 6th committee. At the top of the show, we mentioned former Pence chief of staff, Mark Short, just testified with the committee. Can you broadly tell us what was covered and if he provided you with any new leads? Uh, you know, I can't confirm uh, witness testimony. It's, it's up to the witnesses if they want to confirm that. 
Um, but I can't say that we've gotten a tremendous amount of cooperation uh, from people, uh, you know, throughout the states, uh, throughout the former administration, uh, in all uh, over 400 people that we've been able to interview and tens of thousands of documents. So we're getting a lot of cooperation. We're filling in a lot of the pieces. And, you know, the puzzle, uh, as we fill it in, shows multiple, multiple lines of effort to overturn the election. It wasn't just a violent attack as heinous as that was on January 6th, but uh, the potential of seizing voting machines, of sending mm -hmm. fake slates of electors uh, to the archives, of trying to get the Justice Department to discourage states from sending any slate of electors and delay the process. So there were multiple lines of effort, all of which we're investigating and, and we're getting a lot of cooperation. So given all that cooperation you've received, all the information you already have, do you need testimony from Mike Pence himself? I, you know, I think Mike Pence uh, would have very relevant testimony for our committee, um, things that uh, he may alone be privy to uh, or uh, alone among those who would be willing to testify. Any conversations uh, that he had with people uh, in an effort to coerce him uh, to overturn the election, to ignore his constitutional duty, that pressure campaign on him uh, and other uh, issues that he may be aware of. So I think he's a very pertinent witness. Uh, I think he could have a lot of insights to share with us. Uh, I hope, as our chairman has said, that he will uh, decide voluntarily to come in. Um, but uh, uh, I'll have to leave it there. Has he been asked voluntarily to come in? Uh, I don't know whether the formal request has been made. Uh, I know our chairman has publicly uh, invited him to testify or expressed his interest in the vice president testifying, but I don't know if that has been uh, memorialized uh, in writing at this point. What are you waiting for? Uh, well, it'll be a decision for the committee when the time is right. Uh, we are trying to sequence our interviews uh, so that we, uh, you know, before we get to central figures like Mike Pence, uh, we interview all those around uh, that person who may have relevant information so that we can inform the questions we ask of those other witnesses. Uh, it's a pretty standard investigative yeah. practice uh, and one I think we've been using very successfully. And you would know it well as a former federal prosecutor yourself. Let's move to these draft orders to seize voting machines. As we've reported, one plan would have used the Pentagon, the other Homeland Security, and the New York Times reports that then President Trump actually directed Rudy Giuliani to put out feelers with Homeland Security about potentially seizing voting machines from some, some key swing states. Can you confirm this? Do you have information showing a direct line to Trump on this? Um, our committee is not confirming uh, the public reporting, uh, so I can't uh, confirm it uh, at this point. But I can say that if the public reporting is accurate, um, this wasn't just some intangible idea. Uh, it appears that there were some concrete steps being taken uh, or instructions being given by the former president to potentially operationalize this. Uh, and, you know, that really ought to take our breath away. The idea of a U.S. president uh, who contemplating when they lose an election, contemplating seizing the voting machines, using the machinery of the federal government to seize state voting machines and local voting machines. Uh, you know, it's third world, world uh, kind of stuff, not what you'd expect uh, in the United States of America of an established democracy. And so it's pretty startling uh, if these public reports uh, are accurate. And quickly, I do want to get your comments and thoughts on this reporting that we have and it's been confirmed by the National Archives that some of Trump's White House documents were ripped up and had to be taped back together by the National Archives. And these were documents handed over to your committee after, you know, the judicial process uh, said he could not exert executive privilege over these. What were these torn up documents? You know, I, I uh, unfortunately I can't comment on that. Um, there, ha there has been public reporting of uh, the president having a practice of tearing things up, um, but whether that's the case here, I'm not able to confirm. Uh, but uh, you know, we are getting hundreds of records from the archives. Uh, they're coming to us from the archives in whatever form the archives have them, uh, and uh, and of course we are scrutinizing them carefully and expect to get a lot more uh, over time uh, from the National Archives as well. And I know that eventually you're going to make some of these findings, if not all of them, public through public hearings and other presentations. How soon until there's that first or next public hearing? Uh, you know, I think fairly soon. Uh, I, I think the chairman has said in the spring we intend to begin those public hearings. Uh, so that's not too far away. 
Uh, we want to sequence them in a way that makes sense for the public watching uh, so that they can see the the whole narrative of these multiple lines of effort to overturn the election, uh, when they began and where they began and who was involved. Uh, so we're trying to uh, make sure that we do the investigative work first uh, so that anything we disclose in the public hearings doesn't impede some of the other investigative work that's still ongoing. Sure. I, I understand that. Obviously, there is a timeline here, though, with the midterm elections also around the corner. Congressman Adam Schiff, really appreciate all of your time. Thank you very much.